All right, let's crack open them brain folds and learn about the various measures of development like gross domestic product, gross national product, and all the other grossness that you have to know for this topic. So if you're ready to get them brain cows milked, let's get to it. Okay, now in the last video, we talked all about how countries across the world fall into one of three categories, namely core, semi-periphery, or periphery. And on this scale, core countries are more economically developed, semi-periphery countries less developed, and periphery countries the least developed of all. So the point is we essentially group all these countries into these three categories based solely on their economic factors. But I come bearing good news, my dear pupil, it turns out that it's a little more complicated than that, which, you know, now that I say it, sounds kind of like bad news. But whatever, you need to know it regardless. So there are, in fact, many other measures human geographers use in order to classify countries on the spectrum, and it's a slew, so let's get into it. First is the country's gross national product, otherwise known as GNP, and this measures the total value of all the goods and services a nation's citizens produce in a given period of time, regardless of where those goods and services are produced. So the thing to remember here is that GNP is an economic measure of products created by citizens and companies of a particular country, and the emphasis is on the products, not the location. For example, maybe you've heard of Toyota, which is a Japanese car company that sells a metric buttload of vehicles in the United States of America. And as it turns out, Toyota has built lots of factories in the U.S. in order to assemble those cars and has dealerships all around the nation. So when I buy a Toyota at my local dealership, I bought it here in the United States. But that income is counted as part of Japan's GNP because, again, GNP emphasizes citizens and their economic output regardless of where that output occurs. Okay, and then second, let's talk about gross domestic product, or GDP. And this is close to GNP, but with one crucial difference. GDP measures the total value of goods and services produced within the borders of a country in a given period of time. So whereas GNP measures the economic output of a country's citizens, GDP measures economic output based on geographic area, regardless of whether those citizens produce those goods or not. So GDP is all about the location in which goods were produced. So in this case, when I buy a Toyota manufactured and sold in the United States, that money is counted in the U.S. GDP, not Japan. And look, I can already start to see your eyes eyes glazing over, so let me just bring you back. Both GDP and GNP are different ways of measuring a country's economic output, and that measure contributes to whether we classify them as core, periphery, or semi-periphery. And economists are always trying to figure out the best way to measure a country's wealth, and some are better than others. GNP, for example, has fallen out of favor, while GDP has become a more reliable measure of economic development today. Okay, now before we continue with this lovely list that we have going, let me just mention that if you need help getting an A in your class and a 5 on your exam in May, you might want to check out my AP Human Geography Heimler Review Guide. It's the fastest way to study, and it's got everything you need. It's got exclusive videos from this guy, notes to follow along, practice questions, practice exams, and answer keys for every dang bit of it. So, you know, if that's something that you're into, check the link in the description. Okay, now the third measure you need to know is gross national income, otherwise known by its SAS, your acronym, GNI. And this measures the total income, or, you know, money earned by a country's businesses and labor force. So the GNI of a country also includes its GDP, but also includes citizens' earnings produced overseas. So it's a very similar concept to GNP, but there the focus is on valuing all all the goods and services produced, while GNI focuses on the value of income earned through all economic activity, as well as foreign investment. So this is a measure that is far better for assessing the economic standing of developing countries, and here's why. If we only measure the GDP of a developing country, which would include all the economic value of all the goods produced, that might paint a pretty bleak picture. After all, a large part of what it means to be a developing country is that you don't produce the level of goods and services anywhere close to what's produced in core countries. But developing nations are often the recipients of financial and economic investment from core countries countries, which is what we call foreign direct investment. So GNI takes that kind of investment into account in order to accurately assess the level of development. And then fourth, but related, is GNI per capita. Now, the word per capita is a fancy Latin phrase meaning per person. So the GNI per capita divides the GNI by a country's population and shows the level on average of each individual citizen's income. So this is just a way of refining GNI to make it a little more accurate. However, GNI per capita does not take into account the actual distribution of income in a country, which might include a significant gap between the wealthy and poor citizens. And you can also see the other economic measures I mentioned broken down like this too. For example, GDP per capita. And it's the same concept, just looking at a country's wealth on the average individual scale instead of the scale of the whole country. Okay, now I wish I could tell you that we're done with the various measures of development, but there are still a few more. So if you need to go get a stuffed animal and cry a little... <laughs> I won't judge. All right, fifth, we can look at income distribution to assess levels of development. This measure considers the difference in proportion of wealthy to poor citizens. So countries that have a smaller gap between those two groups are considered more developed because people there have a wider array of economic activities. Countries that have a wide gap between rich and poor tend to be less developed because there are less opportunities. For example, in Brazil, 1% of the population holds 50% of the wealth, which means there's a massive gap between the wealthy and the poor. And then moving right along, the sixth measure of economic development is a country's fertility rate. So in general, as fertility 
fertility rates fall, it indicates a more developed country. Recall that as women have more access to education, they tend to have fewer babies and vice versa. So countries with high fertility rates, like many nations in sub-Saharan Africa, indicate less opportunities for women, and thus they are considered less developed. And then seventh and related to that is a measurement of a country's infant mortality rate. As access to healthcare increases, the infant mortality rate decreases and vice versa. And since it's a general rule that women in wealthier countries have more access to healthcare than more impoverished countries, it's a good indicator of a country's level of development. And finally, the eighth measure of development is a country's access to healthcare. And I know that sounds exactly like what I just said, but here we're talking about the whole population, not just mothers. But it's the same concept. Countries that have abundant access to healthcare are more developed, and that tends to result in longer lifespans. Okay, now the big idea to take away from all of this is that when geographers want to understand the economic well-being of a country, these are the measures they often consult. In general, as a country's GDP or GNP or GNI or the rest increases, they are becoming healthier and wealthier economically. And if those measures are decreasing, then the country's economic health is also decreasing. Okay, now another major indicator of a country's level of development is the structure of its economic sector. And yeah, I know this is another economic measure and probably should have been grouped in the last section, but dang, man, we just, we needed a fresh start here. So remember from the last video, we talked about the different economic sectors that are present in countries throughout the world. And I won't rehash all that here, so you can go watch that if you need a refresher. But here I'll just say that economies that are characterized by tertiary sectors and above are considered more developed than economies characterized by primary and secondary sectors, which are considered less developed. And because I love you, I need to introduce a further complication to these designations. What I mean is no matter which sector is primarily present in a country's economy, that economic measure can be further refined into both formal and informal sectors. So formal sectors include every business that is incorporated and is registered according to state and national laws. So the Walmart down the road does business legally because it's registered with the state to do so. But many countries also have significant informal sectors, which include all kinds of economic activity that operate outside the boundaries of government oversight. This would include things like undocumented migrant workers or getting paid in cash for babysitting or any economic activity that goes under the radar of big daddy government. So here's the thing. If no informal economic sectors existed, then it would be pretty dang simple to measure a country's level of development with something like GDP or GNI. But as it turns out, those measures only take into account the economic output of a country's formal sector. So that means that the presence of informal economic sectors undermines the accuracy of measures like GDP or GNI. It's estimated that in many core countries, the informal sector represents an additional 10 to 20 percent in value above the gross measures. However, informal sectors are far more prevalent in peripheral countries and in some cases can constitute almost half the nation's economic value. For example, if you've ever been to a peripheral country or you live there, you might have bought some kind of art or trinket from a person with a kiosk on some street corner. That is the informal economy. So all that to say, the larger a country's informal sector, the less developed they tend to be. And the smaller the informal sector it is, the more developed they are. Okay, now another way to measure a country's development is by considering social measures in addition to the economic measures. And I'll give you two important ones. First is the Gender Inequality Index, or the GII. And not surprisingly, this is a measure of the equality or inequality of men and women in a given society. Now, this is an important measure of development because as we've seen over and over again, as the role of women changes in a society, it affects the society's economic development. And so there are essentially three components that go into the overall measure of the GII. First is reproductive health, which includes the maternal mortality rate, or you know how many women die during childbirth, and adolescent birth rates, which measures how many adolescent girls become pregnant. So in general, lower maternal mortality indicates more access to healthcare and thus greater development and vice versa. And then high adolescent birth rates indicate lower levels of education and thus less development and vice versa. Okay, the second component of GII is empowerment, which measures how many seats women hold in parliamentary bodies and the percentage of women who have obtained higher education in a country. And then the third component is labor market participation, which measures the proportion of men to women in a country's workforce. And ultimately what you need to remember is this. Countries with a high GII are generally less developed, while those with a lower GII are more developed. It's an inverse relationship, like greater inequality, less developed, less inequality, more developed. Okay, now the second social measurement of development is called the Human Development Index, or HDI. Now, this was created by the folks at the United Nations and is a measure of human well-being, which includes economic health and a range of other measures as well. The idea is that good economies open up more choices for people, and when they have more choices, they invest in things that improve their well-being, like education and healthcare. So the HDI uses GDP and then adds a country's life expectancy, level of education, and literacy rates to assess the social development within its borders. So think of the HDI as a more holistic measure that includes important parts of all the other measures we've talked about so far. And oh my goodness, you made it. So click here to keep reviewing other Unit 7 topics and click here to grab my AP Human Geography Heimler Review Guide, which is the fastest way to study for that national exam coming up. I appreciate you sticking around and I'll catch you on the flip-flop. Heimler out.